So I'd like to thank our collaborators uh, for their help. Uh, because obviously with research like this, you need um, a lot of good collaboration to go forward. So I suppose in essence, um, we're talking about some brand new area of science. And uh, this is a, a slide that features uh, my old professor, Professor Liggins. And um, the importance of this is that that's me as a little baby. And when I was a little baby, Professor Liggins was working out childbirth, and not just in the human, but in all mammalian species. And until 1967, everyone believed that actually it was the mother that initiated childbirth. And Professor Liggins showed that, in fact, it wasn't the mother. Uh, it was initiated by the fetus. And so it, it was a paradigm shift in the way people appreciated that part of medicine. And I hope with our understanding of chaperone proteins, we may be able to shift in our understanding of cellular aging, and then as we're gonna to talk today, um, hopefully work on some processes, processes to reverse that. So, sort of getting our mind around proteins, um, I suppose this is just a simple slide that I use. Um, when I originally did my bachelor's degree, uh, we really thought about proteins just as, in two ways. One is a directed protein, so, you know, a specific protein like growth hormone that has a directed role in the body. And then something like a carrier protein like albumin um, that literally is, is function is to help facilitate and carry substances around the body. I certainly wasn't aware that there was another category of protein called active proteins. And um, chaperone proteins that we're going to talk about today are specific active proteins. And... We're going to talk about this one called HSP70, heat shock protein 70. That's just one. Um, it's talked about a lot because it's probably been investigated the most, um, but it's just one of many chaperone proteins that work inside the cell. So I met Professor Campong probably about 10 years ago now, and um, he's uh, had a lot of experience with stem cells, and I found that we actually had quite a lot of synergy because people often ask me, well, how do chaperone proteins fit into stem cells? Um, and I'll just sort of summarize it um, in a very, very simple way. Uh, but essentially, uh, we believe that um, the way in which stem cells work in the body is through what we call a paracrine system. And that mechanism is largely mediated by the chaperone protein axis. So what I'm saying is, in effect, these new cells, these new stem cells, may actually have a lot of their functions specifically channeled through the chaperone protein axis. So can chaperone proteins then be a stem cell? The answer is no. But what they can do is they can affect a certain portion of the activities like what stem cells would do. And in, a, in essence, stem cells can specifically have some type of basis of change of transcription of genes. And to our knowledge, chaperone proteins don't have that function. But what, they, what chaperone proteins do do is they enable the translation of the gene, the message that comes out of the gene, the translation of that into a functional protein. And that there is the regulation of the internal workings of the cell. So this is quite a complex slide, but essentially it shows how the message goes from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm of the cell and then that message is actually made into a protein. And so this is the part that chaperone proteins start to initiate. And then as we're gonna go through, they also actually functionally run how the cell deals with proteins and gets rid of proteins. So chaperone proteins are quite key to all of the internal workings of the cell. And through that, that function, they are integrally involved in repair and regeneration. And if you have something that's involved in repair and regeneration of a cell, then that's also going to affect not just that cell, but the cells around it, the organ, and the body itself. So it has a threefold axis. And they do them in a couple, sorry, they do this in a couple of different ways. Um, one is actually through refolding proteins in us inside our cell, and we'll go through that a little bit more. Another way which is um, very, very topical is chaperone proteins actually protect your telomeres. So um, I won't get into the long debate about 
telomeres and aging, but essentially what they do do is they act as free radical scavengers inside the cell and through that function actually pr protect the telomere. And then finally, and we'll talk about this at the end of the seminar, they actually have the ability to reverse cell death. And we believe that we'll show you today um, the first research that's shown this in the world. So I mentioned um, briefly, the chaperone proteins inside the cell are involved with protein folding. That's both at the original translation phase, but also um, it's believed that some proteins will be misfolded accidentally and chaperone proteins can actually refold those proteins to make them functional. They're also involved in, uh, in the transportation of those proteins outside the cell uh, and probably actually with presentation of those proteins. And then the other role that often is overlooked, but it's probably one of the most important roles, is actually degradation of proteins. So essentially we have little bits of junk proteins accumulate inside our cell and chaperone proteins are functionally involved in getting rid of those little bits of protein. So that degradation part is a very important feature. What the slide shows is actually chaperone proteins, which is this complex you'll see there, um, actually folding a protein and presenting that to the cytoplasm. It then can be transported outside the cell and it functionally will be active. The, the sort of to toilet mechanism of the cell of getting rid of the proteins is called the ubiquitin protease pathway. And so essentially the chaperone protein in this case literally can chop up and fragment the protein and then that can go into a vacuole and then be expelled from the cell. So this basically keeps the cell clean and then keeps the cell functional. So this whole thing is leading to a stabilization in intracellular protein homeostasis and that in itself allows repair and regeneration of the cell. So this is a very unique axis, and I like to refer to it as the chaperone protein axis because it really is a hormonal axis. Although we keep talking about intracellular function, it also has the ability to affect the cells around, as I said before, the organs and the body as a whole. So one thing we do know is that um, chaperone proteins and their functionality decrease with age inside our cells. And when a cell gets close to death and goes towards apoptosis, uh, chaperone proteins actually are now non-functional. And so I suppose the holy grail of this research and you know, literally clinically what we're trying to achieve is not just to help protect the cell, but to actually reverse cells out of imminent cell death, so out of apoptosis and actually get them functional again. And we'll expand on this concept as the seminar progresses. So I like to talk about um, aging, and I suppose aging is one of those things where there's a lot of debate about it, um, about sort of what it's caused by. Um, and I just sort of like to basically grab a whole heap of research and, and sort of put it all together. And um, this is sort of a unified theory of aging. Um, but I suppose the way I like to start is that aging um, is both chronological, so, you know, I'm just coming up 52 now, um, but it's also biological. And, uh, and once we sort of get those two concepts in our brain, then we realize that my biologic age could actually be different than my chronologic age. Uh, so, in fact, my cells could feel that, like that they're older than 52. Or if I add functionality to my cells, um, in fact, they potentially could be younger than 52. So we don't really know the exact causes of aging, but one, one thing we do know is that um, mitochondria get unstable in our cells and they do project to produce free radicals. Chaperone proteins are there, they're the natural antioxidant inside our cell, but as we age, then the, the chaperone proteins go, so we have an increase in reactive oxygen species. And this inside our cell, uh, as our chaperone proteins are decreasing, so our ability to fight this is decreased. And so this actually does eat away. At, we, we know that the telomere does get smaller through this process. And this can both eat away at both telomeric DNA and potentially coding DNA. So this leads to cellular dysfunction and ultimately putting that cell into imminent uh, cellular destruction, apoptosis, and then cell death. So 
I suppose the take home message there is with age, chaperone proteins decrease. And then the only way that um, we have of combating the rise in reactive oxygen species is to somehow repair the cell and get chaperone proteins back in. So it sort of asked the question is okay, if this is a progressive mechanism, is there a way that this can be reversed? Uh, and if it, if, if it could be reversed, then potentially what could happen is you could uh, reverse some of the aging process. So we specifically uh, have been, um, have a product. Um, it's the only product uh, of its type in the world. It's chaperone proteins. It's uh, a natural biologic product. And we've been using this in the anti-aging sphere for the last 10 years. We think it's not just a very innovative product, but we think it's an extremely exciting product. And we'll go through the mechanisms of, of action. Um, it is a topical application, uh, so um, it, it meets uh, the FDA requirements. Um, and, uh, and it's very effective at not just going in, into the systemic circulation, but actually inside the cell. So as I said, we, we talk about HSP70, and this is just one of the key chaperone proteins. Um, the reason that we, fun we functionally focus on this a lot is that it's been researched a lot, uh, and we have a very solid assay for this. It's not the only biological marker we look at, uh, but it's a very important marker, so that we can actually tell that chaperones are working and that they have a biologic role. This product comes uh, out of New Zealand, uh, which is where I'm natively from, uh, and uh, is available around the world. So, I've talked a lot about aging and some basic mechanisms of how chaperone proteins work inside the cell, and I just sort of want to um, incorporate this into disease models and then talk about disease prevention and treatment. So, this is just an abstract, and it just is there to point out that the literature is saying that approximately 40% of diseases are attributable to protein misfolding. So that even includes mutations. Because of the misfolding of the protein, the mutation will cause misfolding of the protein. So that's an extremely high percentage of disease. And then if that is the case, then is this a, a sudden thing? And there probably are some things like mucopolysaccharide storage diseases that are uh, quite sudden in onset, that, that can be quite acute with young children. But then there are some other things like we'll talk about things like uh, another protein dysfunction is Alzheimer's. Um, and this could be a very, very slow onset. So these protein changes um, are probably more cumulative than sudden. Uh, and we believe that we can slow this and also possibly reverse this process. We know we can, we can actually alleviate and reverse to some point um, whether we can reverse the entire process, um, that's only for time to tell, but it's certainly a very exciting thing that we're working on right now. So the type of clinical conditions that we're talking about um, are anti-aging, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, general tissue repair, which includes you know, athletic rehabilitation, um, non-metastatic prostatic disease, uh, kidney dysfunction, diabetes, and myocardial disease. So I'd like to just talk about a couple of very specific diseases and give an overview of how we believe the chaperone protein axis not only leads to the genesis of this, of this disease, but how we potentially can use this process to alleviate. So essentially, the not just Parkinson's disease itself, but a lot of other neurodegenerative disorders are actually caused by abnormal folding of proteins and also the lack of clearance. So back to the UPP, the ubiquitin protease pathway, the lack of clearance of potentially cytotoxic proteins actually is believed to be um, a big part of the etiology of Parkinson's disease. So if we have a mechanism by helping the chaperone protein axis inside the cell, then we believe that we can actually reverse some of these symptoms and um, at least slow the onset of this disease. So again, um, when I first uh, wrote a patent on this, this was, it was never mentioned. Um, 
uh, we were the first group to ever mention this, but if you think about Alzheimer's disease, um, it, it's a neurodegenerative condition, and it's, it's fundamentally a, a protein, both misfolding inside the cell, but also a protein accumulation problem. And so um, with the plaques, uh, we basically have protein accumulation outside the cell. And so if we can prevent this, then we can uh, go a long way to getting proper cellular function actually and causing prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Probably the biggest um, uh, area uh, that there has been sort of some animal model work done is in myocardial disease. Um, chaperone proteins are believed to be uh, very key to the functioning of myoblasts. And uh, there's been some really nice work where um, essentially it's been shown that HSP70 can actually be cytoprotective. And so when they've actually set up a heart attack model in laboratory species, they've shown that actually you can, um, you can cause um, a decrease in the damage uh, by actually uh, using chaperone proteins uh, as compared to the control. So that cytoprotective mechanism is the key thing that we're looking at here. So we're talking about one thing which is which is causing myocytes to come back and come back into, into function, but also to actually prevent uh, further damage. And hopefully we'll be able to show that we can actually prevent damage for a start. So the again, back to that basic model of, uh, of actually being a reactive oxygen species scavenger and actually preventing that cell from entering into the apoptotic pathway. You know, once, once the cell enters there, it's believed um, that essentially um, it's, it's gone. Uh, we're going to show you um, some really good hope um, that we believe that we can actually get some of those cells backwards. That's how strong chaperone protein therapy can be. Uh, but essentially in, in those theoretical models and in those laboratory species models, they've shown that if you induce a heart attack, um, the animals that get given chaperone proteins uh, have, um, have a lower level of disease and actually their myocytes come back into, into full function. Now, what's sort of interesting about this research is there has been problems with making recombinant um, HSP70. Uh, so we're talking about a natural biologic source of HSP70 and also the other chaperone proteins like HSP10, 90, 110, et cetera, 40. Uh, the recombinant uh, problems they've had could be just caused um, by the way in which recombinant proteins are made in E. coli, but uh, people don't really specifically know. So we were looking um, at um, very uh, solid research. What was the pathway we can go down to actually show functionally exactly how chaperone proteins work and how they can be used uh, to both prevent clinical disease, but also to use a model that we can show a reversing of a disease process. So using our product chaperones, we specifically wanted to look at kidney function. And the basic hypothesis here is that, um, and this is obviously is you know, not in an infectious model, but this is in a chronic nephrotic model uh, where the kidney function has decreased with age. So we'll just call it wear and tear uh, for lack of better words. And so what we see uh, on the left, we see a normal functioning kidney. And on the right, we see a chronic atritic kidney. Essentially what we're saying is that, that the kidney on the right is clogged. And so if in fact that's right, and that a lot of the cytoplasms are just clogged with and, and protein accumulates are there, it might be possible to use chaperone proteins to go inside those cytoplasms of those cells and actually functionally get those cells to start working again. So the two major mechanisms again, are refolding of those proteins and actually getting those protein accumulates and putting them through the UPP and getting them outside the cell. So reactivating the toilet mechanism of the cell. So those two functional pathways. So the idea is that the nephrons are actually sitting in suspended animation. They're not workable, uh, but they're actually not necrotic. So they're that one step before imminent cell death. So they're in apoptosis. They're actually not in necrosis. They're not gone yet. 
And, you know, this is a, a major uh, clinical disease around the world, which I don't need to remind anyone about, um, but very, very large, um, and not just as far as uh, the, the financial, but anyone who's had uh, um, a family member with chronic kidney disease just knows how heartbreaking can be and how intense treatment like dialysis can be. So there is only one um, sort of recognised animal model uh, for looking at chronic kidney disease, and uh, this is the CAT model, which um, is the chronic end-stage renal disease CAT. And I won't bore you too much. My original degree is in veterinary science. I'm a veterinarian by trade um, before I got involved in science. And it turns out that if you are an older cat and you haven't been hit on the road, um, essentially if you're kept in a beautiful home, in a, in a beautiful environment, you're going to get chronic kidney disease and that's probably what you're going to die of. So um, we were able to get ethical approval quite easily uh, to do the study uh, because essentially we had a group of cats um, that uh, were at a cat colony and they all had um, end-stage kidney disease. So essentially we had um, a group of treatment cats and a, a group of control cats, 20 of each, and we treated them with chaperones, the treatment cats, and then the control cats were just treated with saline. So essentially... Um, you'll be thinking, okay, well, that's fine, but how do you know that these are uh, end-stage uh, chronic kidney cats? And that's, that's a pretty, pretty good mechanism of thought. So we need to be able to show in our, um, in our controls that we had a decrease in the kidney function over our test period. And so what the slide shows is a significant decrease in glomerular filtration of those cats. And uh, the reason we've broken into males and females um, is that uh, we show that there was actually a significant uh, that males have significantly worse kidneys, specifically in this in this cat colony. But we probably think so clinically in general. So both males and females uh, over the test time decreased in their kidney function. So we know it's a good model. And then our our cats that we treated with with chaperones, um, the they had an increase in glomerular filtration. So this was both in females and males. There was a significant increase in glomerular filtration. So again, we've got our controls decreasing glomerular filtration, so the kidneys are getting worse in their function, and then our treatments increasing in glomerular filtration. So coming back to what our original hypothesis was, was, well, if this is through the chaperone protein axis, then we should be able to see some type of alteration in chaperone proteins in the cats themselves. So specifically, we, we looked at HSP70 that I've mentioned, which again is just one of the effectors of the chaperone protein axis, and we found in the control cats that they had no difference in um, circulating HSP70 over the treatment interval. You know, uh, they were given saline, so their chaperone protein function did not change. But in the treatment cats that were given chaperones, their HSP70 significantly increased so we believe that we've shown a mechanism of action that the changes in glomerular filtration are mediated through the chaperone protein axis and we've been able to show that we functionally can change systemically uh, circulation of the chaperone protein axis. So in this slide, what we represent is the bottom line is what our normal controls are. So they're decreasing the glomerular filtration. The straight line would be a great result for us. Um, that would be as good as anyone, or would be better than anyone's ever got in the world, is to maintain stasis in a decreasing model. And in fact, we didn't just maintain stasis of the kidneys, we increased stasis. So we really believe that we actually brought cells back into use. So we brought apoptotic cells back into functional use um, which has been mentioned in, in the literature as a possibility, but no one's ever shown it till now. And that's what we call anastasis, so rebirth of cells. So we've been able to show that the glomerular filtration can be increased in, in a very robust animal model. Um, and you know, clearly that was very positive for those cats. This is an ongoing study, so uh, we're actually following these cats and, and looking at this now into longevity. And... So not only can we show an increase in glomerular filtration, but we can also show that it is mediated through the chaperone protein axis. And so that's what we believe our, our, our mechanism of action of our product, chaperones. And so we've been able to show this scientifically. And actually, 
just getting cells to reverse out of eminent cell death, out of apoptosis, uh, again shows that we have stimulated the chaperone protein axis. We believe this is not just a primary mechanism, but it's actually a secondary mechanism. And by that I mean the chaperone proteins are going inside the cell and they're having a functional ability to start to get rid of, of junk protein, start folding proteins properly, and start the cell to function properly. But in doing that, then they themselves can produce their own chaperone proteins, we believe, and that's the secondary effect. So this is a busy slide, and all the different um, disease syndromes and states are listed over on the right of the slide. And this is, you know, again, diabetes, kidney dysfunction, uh, tissue repair, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, general aging. What I'm saying is that we believe that through treating the central chaperone protein axis, through getting that better again, then uh, you can actually help with core mechanisms of action and decrease all of these diseases. So actually decrease the onset, and as we showed in the CAT model, potentially reverse patients out of eminent cell death. So uh, we, for example, we actually have patients. Uh, we have some you know, miraculous case studies we're writing up um, at the moment. Uh, but for example, we have a young lady uh, that was just treated by, um, by a, a doctor, colleague of ours, uh, who was on dialysis, who's now off dialysis. So she's been able to actually have enough of her functioning kidney brought back into play to actually get her off dialysis. Now, can that um, get a necrotic cell back again? No, it can't. Um, but what would happen if we actually prevented a lot of these things happening so that cells didn't get to that point of necrosis. So the key mechanism here is stabilization of the cell. And through stabilization of the cell, then you get normal cytoplasmic function. And then through cytoplasmic function, we get cellular function. So again, uh, translation of the genetic message into a protein. Now, if your cell is packed with protein, you can't have another genetic message come through and be translated into a protein because you've got too much protein inside your cell. So I know it sounds extremely simple, but it really is quite simple. So this is a central chaperone protein axis, quite central to the onset of a lot of general aging and disease. So we believe that we have shown scientifically uh, the role in which the chaperone proteins work and been able to show for the first time uh, that we can actually physically get cells out of apoptosis and actually get them functionally working again. Now that's at an extreme, uh, but obviously there's a whole group in the middle of actually just getting cells to function better. And so as the heart, as the myocardial cells function better, then clearly your blood pressure is gonna be better, it's gonna help the kidney in kind, and so all of those mechanisms then work well together. So I'd like to thank everyone for their attention today. Um, I, I would like to again acknowledge um, all our colleagues that, that have helped um, and thank uh, Vardastem and Professor Kampong uh, for asking me to speak today. Um, and also uh, to mention again, uh, Professor Liggins, who uh, was a, a great mentor of mine uh, from postdoctoral level onwards, um, and uh, how often as he showed that taking a unique approach can cause a fundamental change. Thank you very much. So there's a, um, a question and answer set, uh, part to this mechanism. And the question is, uh, do we have any uh, studies about uh, chaperone proteins and cancer? The short answer is no, uh, but the long answer is complex. Um, with metastatic cancer, um, one thing that is known is that the chaperone protein axis of those individual cancer cells is fantastic. 
because they are becoming immortal cells, essentially. Um, so I'm very, very weary um, around cancer. I think, as I mentioned before, something like uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, we've had um, we've had doctors have had very, very good success uh, with patients um, using chaperones. Um, but myself personally, um, I would stay clear of metastatic cancer. And um, I don't believe that chaperone proteins are an initiator of it, uh, but um, they certainly, um, uh, that mechanism is alive and well in cancer cells. And so I think it's just a worthwhile thing to stay well away from and, and a very good question. So the follow-up question to that is uh, then, what do you do? Um, and uh, with screening, uh, like with, with all things, um, it's very important to, to go and be with your physician. So, um, so we like for chaperones uh, to uh, be talked about and administered by physicians. Um, and uh, again, um, as it's a cosmetic pharmaceutical, um, anyone can actually administer it. Um, it's very easy to administer. Uh, it's topical application on the wrist and the chaperone proteins are taken with the transfer uh, protein oil across into the system. But like with all things, uh, having a regular checkup uh, is the best thing that you can do, and, um, and that's, all, that's all you can recommend, is for patients to work very, very closely with their physician. So the question, the, another follow-up question is um, from a dermatological angle, uh, what effect does it have on skin ageing? And uh, this is actually an area that we're putting um, some considerable collaborative resources uh, into right at the moment. Uh, again, we're talking about a progressive process. So you can look at my skin. Um, I'm of Irish descent, uh, so um, the, I'm not going to suddenly look like I'm a brand new baby. Um, this, that's not going to happen. Um, but there is a lot of, of patients have uh, have said that they believe that their skin has been very positively affected, and so we're actually uh, scientifically determining that um, as we speak. Uh, what I do know is um, that I've never seen any ill effects whatsoever of using chaperones, and in theory, chaperones should work very very positively, uh, both for some reversal of some aging of, of skin, but also, uh, and probably more importantly, uh, to uh, have uh, prevention of aging. So, um, as far as the question uh, going, is it uh, then a holistic approach? Then absolutely it is. So uh, we're basically saying there is there is a core protein mechanism inside our cells um, that uh, keeps our translational self, which is every functioning of every single cell, um, ha happy and healthy. And um, as that starts to break, as we get older, uh, then that affects the cells around us, the organs, and then our whole body systems. Uh, so it is a fundamental, and so it's probably as holistic a mechanism um, as we know about. There's also a question with regards to um, to genetic testing uh, for um, looking at, at cancer screening. Um, as we all know, um, there are some tremendous uh, genetic tests out there and some uh, tremendous tests in general. Uh, an area that we do a lot of research in is cell free DNA, for example. And you know, there's cell free DNA can be um, a very, very good test for certain types of cancer. Um, but like all things, uh, there is no test that we know of, um, whether that be a, a blood test, genetic test, um, 
or any other screening test that's foolproof. So it's like all things, um, you just need to work with your, with your physician as good as you can. So the protocol that we use for chaperone protein um, is uh, we like to have four treatments uh, and we space them one week apart. So again, it's topical application. We have um, a transfer protein oil that we add to the chaperones themselves. And then we actually apply the substance to the wrist. Um, it could be applied anywhere. The reason we use the wrist is because it's vascular and it's clean and that there is no soap residue uh, with proteins. Um, any area that we think there would be soaps, like the face without you know, a lot of care, uh, could cause a destruction of the proteins. So our treatment regime is uh, once weekly for four treatments, so over a month of time, and then to give the body a break. And, uh, and that's a mechanism. We've done a little bit of model species work, specifically in the horse, uh, and um, I really believe that the break is very, very important to allow that secondary mechanism that I was talking about. And then uh, we uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of patients, and this is just you know not just for clinical use, but for preventive use. And then we recommend reusing every three months. Not everyone wants to do that. Um, some people want to go longer. Uh, so that's up really up to the individual. And again, working with with your clinician is very, very important. So um, there's a very good question about whether chaperone proteins uh, can actually basically overcome mutations. So there's only, to my knowledge, only been one uh, NICE study done. Uh, again, I believe it was a mouse model, uh, NICE model species, and they actually showed that, um, that the appropriate refolding with chaperone proteins could actually overcome point mutations. If it was a longer mutation than that, myself, I don't, really don't believe so. I believe that there's going to be genetic dysfunction that um, the refolding is not going to overcome whatsoever. So then the question um, is, uh, so can you use chaperone, chaperones um, aesthetically? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and that's, a, that's like a key, key role uh, of chaperone uh, protein therapy. Um, and I often use, um, you know, I've, I've got teenage children. I often use my son as an example. Um, I say, you know, um, you know, he's healthy, he's, uh, he's young. Um, does he need chaperone proteins? I, I don't believe so, personally. Uh, again, we've done some model species work, um, looking at athletic animals, specifically the horse. And, um, and essentially, uh, if the chaperone protein isn't under any structural strain, uh, and this comes uh, with age, and with injury. If it isn't under structural strain, uh, then there's no re reason to use chaperones. Uh, but now, I'm not my son. Um, I'm 52, as I said. And, uh, and can I be benefited by chaperone proteins? I personally believe so, yes. So, um, a very good question about the different types of chaperone protein. So again, I've, I've mentioned very briefly that, you know, we all talk about HSP-70. Literally, these, these things, you'll hear people talk about, you know, HSP-10, HSP-40, HSP-70, on and on, 90, 100, 110. They're actually just sizes. They're, they're actually just kilodaltons. So um, HSP-70 is just 70 kilodaltons. Um, a lot of people have, uh, have been going down looking at, say, just the effects of HSP-70 or just the effects of HSP-90. HSP-70 has been studied um, the most, and as I pointed out, uh, basically the myocardial work is probably the best with just HSP-70 and shows that um, it, it is preventative of cellular death, of um, so in an ischemic model. I personally believe um, that the chaperone proteins working together is something that it, it probably in my lifetime will never get to the bottom of, but is an extremely important thing. So essentially that um, taking out one chaperone protein and saying this is the effector is actually the wrong way. Um, for that end, and why we have a natural biologic product, 
is that um, we have all the chaperone proteins in here. Uh, so um, I haven't altered, and, and in fact, um, it's actually uh, the correct thing to do is to not alter the natural state of the product. And so they are in a natural ratio um, that biologically is predestined. And I think that there is a lot of interaction that goes on. Um, and I also believe, and this is a little bit off topic, but that structural proteins play a role as well. That it's not just the chaperone proteins themselves, but I'm sure that, that at some point, some other structural proteins are playing a role. So, um, so there's a question with regards to hair loss. Um, we have um, we have one one particular uh, doctor that works with us in Asia who's very interested in this area. Um, believes that uh, that uh, chaperones our product uh, has a significant role in um, in enabling some hair follicle regeneration. Scientifically, we just haven't done enough, uh, and it's an area that. You know, I'm very interested to pursue. So, if anyone is interested, please contact me or Professor Kampong. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of positiveness out there. Um, people hate like anecdotes, but uh, the first time I used chaperones, um, I didn't feel any uh, systemic effect at all. But the one thing was my beard was was just perfectly grey, and it actually grew grew back um, a dark dark brown. And that's sort of that's just a personal thing for me. So, can it really reverse grey hair? I, I, I'd say I'd say sort of short answer is probably not. Um, but could it prevent? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, I think that what I described with the telomere um, is, is, is essentially the same with grey hair. Um, I believe that the hair is getting grey because uh, functionally um, the cytoplasm is not keeping up in the hair follicle, and so that's why the growth is impaired, and that's why then you get grey hair. Um, the same with the telomere concept. Uh, then the telomere is decreasing not because it's causing aging, but aging itself is chipping away at the telomere. So the increase in reactive oxygen species inside the cytoplasm is chipping away. So could you prevent that? Yes. Now from taking that cytoplasmic role to the cell itself, can that cell then be functioning better? And could that prevent hair loss? Potentially, yes. Uh, could it pre prevent the hair going grey, potentially yes. I know that I've actually had, you know, just on my face, um, grey hair reversal. Um, but, you know, again, being 52, you guys might look at me and think, well, you actually look like you're 65, so it's not working very well. So the question uh, or, or sort of half statement is that sort of that would be the holy grail. And I totally agree. Um, and we're really, really interested. Uh, so, you know, we're really interested in working with any group that um, that wants to very scientifically uh, go down this pathway and, and look at it uh, because um, it is key for aging of all cells. So it makes sense that the chaperone protein axis is involved in, in hair loss. Uh, and so um, very interested. Anecdotally, um, again, I have doctors tell me that that it is, it's worked, that they've had history patients, that they've uh, fundamentally treated and got, got hair growth. Um, but we need numbers. And so, um, with regards to access to chaperones, um, if, if anyone's interested, if they could contact Dimitri um, at, at Vitastem, that would be the appropriate way. Um, uh, he is intricately knowledgeable about the science behind the product and the product itself. And so, um, so if anyone has an interest, um, please get hold of Dimitri. That'd be really, really good. Well, it's probably getting late for everyone. Uh, over there, it's early for us. Um, but if there's no more questions, I would like to again thank everyone for their attention. I really enjoyed. I've never done a seminar like this before, um, and I hope uh, that I followed Dimitri's instructions and talked slow enough. But thank, thank you, everyone, for your attention.
Goodbye.